Hello, and welcome to episode 8. In this episode, we are going to talk about the symmetry of the octahedron. In organic chemistry, the most important structure is the tetrahedron, as we reviewed in episode 7. In inorganic chemistry, on the other hand, the predominant and most important structure is the octahedron. The tetrahedron tends to be not so important in inorganic chemistry, though it is a representative structure. In inorganic chemistry, the structure of transition metal complexes is dominated by the octahedral structure and by those symmetries which are formed from the octahedron. Here we see an octahedron. Uh, it is called octahedron. Octa means eight. Hedron means faces. So we notice that in the octahedron, there are eight faces. So we see four triangular faces on one side and four triangular faces on the other. We had noticed last week that the tetrahedron had four faces. So it was like having two two-faced friends. Well, the octahedron has twice as many faces as the tetrahedron. So in some ways we could say that the octahedron is twice the shape that the tetrahedron is. Not only from the number of faces, but also from the number of symmetry operations. In the point group TD, the point group of the tetrahedron, there are 24 symmetry operations. For the octahedron, point group OH, there are 48 symmetry operations. So there actually are twice as many symmetry operations for the octahedron as there are for the tetrahedron. Here we see two octahedra in their native habitat running free. Here is another octahedron. In this case, we have built the models with different color triangles for each face. But we have uh, done it in such a way that on opposing sides of the octahedra, the faces are exactly the same color. And each of these faces, the orange face here and the orange face there, for example, the pink face on this side and then pink face on the other side, those sides are parallel to each other. So in this particular model, the parallel sides are all colored the same. By uh, cutting out additional triangles and coloring each of the faces of the octahedra, it might make it easier to see exactly uh, more clearly the structure of the octahedron. With this octahedron, we can see some of the important uh, symmetry features. For example, if we look down this particular axis, we can see sort of a four-fold symmetry, kind of see a square sort of shape. And if we look in this direction, we see a number of three-sided triangular faces. So the numbers three and four are going to be very important when we talk about the symmetry properties of the octahedron. Here we have another octahedron. In this particular model, we've cut out triangles into each of the opposing faces. One of the advantages of doing this that allows you to actually see into and through the octahedron. So in some cases, it may be easier to visualize what's going on with a particular shape by using this type of a model. To see even better, we have a model with most of the inside cut out, and now we can see the structure of the octahedron, uh, certain aspects of it, particularly the threefold axis, much more clearly by doing it this way. Turn it around. Looking from the top, we can kind of see the fourfold symmetry. And then looking down this way, you can see the threefold symmetry. There 
So that is the octahedron. An interesting feature of the octahedron is that we can nest it very easily inside a unit square. So here we have a unit square and we can see inside the octahedron and the octahedron touches the unit square at the center of each face, exactly in the center. So since there are six faces in a cube and there are six vertices in an octahedron, each one of the vertices of the octahedron touches the unit square exactly in the center of one of the six faces. Now, this shows that there's a very close relationship between the symmetry of the cube and the octahedron. And it also leads to another interesting consequence in that if we have to quickly write down the coordinates for an octahedron, it is very easy to do because we can imagine that we have set up our coordinate system so that this particular point here, for example, is the origin and then we go in the x direction uh, by one unit. So this would be the coordinate zero, one zero, one zero zero. And then in this direction, go this way, this would be minus one zero zero. And then uh, we can work our way down to the, uh, the back of the cube. So since each of the uh, vertices actually is in the center of a face, we can very efficiently uh, set up our coordinate system. Uh, this point here is zero, zero, 001, I should have said, because we're imagining that the center of the coordinate system entirely is the center of the octahedron. So that would be the point zero, zero, 0000. So this would be zero, zero, 001. This would be 101. One. This point would be minus 101. One. So we have the various different uh, points. And d writing the coordinates of the octahedron based upon the unit square is very useful if one wants to use the Kim method to derive the symmetry adapted linear combinations of orbitals for an octahedral complex or a tetrahedral complex. So uh, this ability, it also allows a student to efficiently draw an octahedron very quickly. If they're able to draw a three-dimensional cube, then all they need to do is to connect the various sides of the cube and they be able to uh, draw a nested octahedron inside there very easily. Now this is certainly an example of an octahedron in captivity. Uh, we've tried to treat the octahedron very well here. Um, you can see that if we were to have zookeepers who wanted to build the smallest possible enclosure for our octahedron, you could see that one of the ways they could do it would be to do it as a cube. You also see in this particular model by cutting out as much as possible it allows us to get a, a more three-dimensional view of the relationship between the octahedron, its various own points, and between uh, the octahedron and the cube. It's not perfectly rectilinear because uh, having added uh, colored walls with another layer of poster board and once you glue it, it tends to uh, warp a little bit. So uh, it's a little tricky making it perfectly rectilinear, but um, mathematically it is, uh, will perfectly nest inside a unit cube of this type. In octahedral uh, transition metal complexes, there is a important relationship between the geometry of the octahedron and the geometry of the d orbitals that are so important in transition metal bonding. We were able to build models where we had actually print out what the d orbitals look like. And the d orbitals are actually lined up with the proper axes. So in this particular case we see the d um, xy orbital. So the x-axis goes in this direction. The y-axis goes in this direction, and coming out would be the z orbital. We see that uh, in the d orbitals themselves, we have the proper phase relationships, because here we see 
positive with positive. So this is Garada and negative with negative. So it's also Garada. Garada means that it's symmetric with respect to inversion. And the fact that d orbitals are Garada, uh, symmetric with respect to inversion, leads to very, very important spectroscopic properties. We also notice one reason why this arrangement of d orbitals is so important is that we see that we set up our axes in such a way that they point towards the ligands. So these L's are four of the six ligands. Um, in this particular model, the other ligands will be up here and down here. So they'll be in an octahedral arrangement. This model is built in such a way that we can open and close it. We see it's an octahedron this way, but we can open it up to visualize the d orbitals on the central atom. So in this particular case, we see that the lobes of the orbitals point between the ligands. They don't point directly at them, they point between them. Because of this, this particular orbital has relatively lower energy. So this is dxy, and there are two more in the same group. Um, they look similar, and their effect uh, is dissimilar. So here we have the orbital dyz. Again, we see that all the d orbitals are garata, and this particular d orbital, the lobes point in between the ligands, so that reduces the electrostatic repulsion between the electrons that are in the d orbital on the central transition metal atom and the electrons on the ligands. So that is dyz. And last but not least, we have dxz. Again, uh, we have four of the six ligands shown in one of the planes. And so all three of the orbitals that have been built using the orange, you can get, get all these on here at the same time, but all three of these that have been built using the orange poster board, because the ligands point, uh, the orbitals point between the ligands, these have reduced uh, electrostatic repulsion. So these three orbitals tend to drop in energy. They are triply degenerate. They have exactly the same energies. So these we label as T2G. They are G because they are garata. They're the orbitals. T signifies that we have a triply degenerate um, set of states. So these are the three T2Gs.